Hi everybody, first of all, thank you for attending this webinar. Today we'll be focusing on clinical auditory evoke potential or AEPs. As you attend this webinar, I just want to let you know that all our recordings and our other webinars are available on our clinical website, which address you can see on the bottom of uh, this slide. Those webinars are provided by the clinical application team, which are employees that are focused in specific modalities. We have one team for EMG IOM, one for EEG ICU, one for sleep, and all of us are creating those documents for your training and information. About myself, my name is Anthony Milo. I'm application specialist at Natus. Entered the company in 2011 on the field for our French office. Was dedicated to uh, EEG, EMG, and IOM, and joined the international team last year to cover fully um, EMG and IOM in the EMEA region. So let's go to the AEPs. When we discuss AEPs, I want first of all to give you a few definitions or terminology that we are using for those specific protocols. First of all, what is an auditory evoked potential? The auditory evoked potential is the recording of cortex activity induced by an, an auditory stimulation. Because of that, there are several groups of auditory evoked potential that we can define the early responses, the middle latency responses, and the late responses. Those three groups will apply to different tests. So the early responses are responses from the cortex below 10 milliseconds. Those early responses correspond to testings such as ABR or BAEP. The middle latency responses are responses that are between 10 milliseconds and 50 milliseconds, which are not that much used um, in clinical use. And finally, we have the late responses, which are responses from the cortex beyond 50 milliseconds. Basically, those are responses that are um, assessing the patient attention, for example. Some of the tests that may be used for those late responses are called P300 or MMN for mismatch negativity. Because we record evoked potential, which are tiny potentials, what we need to talk about is averaging. Averaging allows to extract a potential that is buried in some activity, which can be EEG or muscle activity. Um, the evoked potential that we are recording are so tiny and recorded from the brain that they're actually buried completely in, e in um, EEG activity from the patient. So therefore, we average the signal to create a mean waveform that will really single out the responses to the auditory stimulation. So as you can see on the right side, the idea is to record the direct signal for each stimulus and then create consecutive averaged groups so that in the end we can extract the pure um, stimulus reaction and then amplifying the signal we actually get a waveform that will be reproducible corresponding to the response to that specific stimulus. The EEG signal in that case is handled kind of like a noise which would be random and if we average it over time, shall cancel. Talking about stimulus, we need to define a few terms about stimulus polarity. There are three polarities that are used in auditory uh, stimulations, condensations, rarefaction and alternation. Condensation is applying a positive pressure on the ear thanks to a headset or tube insert. Rarefaction is the opposite. We apply a negative pressure on the tympanum. And alternation is a mix between condensation and rarefaction. In that case, we do 
one-time condensation, one-time rarefaction, and those stimuli will be introduced. This uh, method is um, quite useful because whenever we stimulate a patient, there is a stimulus artifact. The condensation will give a stimulus artifact in one direction, rarefaction in the other direction. So alternation theoretically will cancel that stimulus artifact. Finally, the last term that we need to define are the, stimu the stimulus pattern. There are three major groups of patterns that are used in auditory evoked potential. Clicks, peeps, and bursts. A click is a monophasic square shape <coughs> of a specific duration that will um, basically assess a large um, hearing range of a patient. And that's basically what we use in BAEP or for short latency responses. Peeps are kind of a click with a specific frequency that allows to assess the hearing capability of a patient at a specific range. And different envelopes may be used to better extract the response from the patient. Tone bursts are stimulations that are mainly used in late responses. So those are the three groups that we may hear of. Now let's focus on early responses. The early responses are testings that are called ABR or BAEP, BAER, there are several names for us. The ACNS has uh, released guidelines on those tests and that's what I want to share with you now. So the, A the ABR or BAER are two terms for those short latency responses. ABR stands for auditory brainstem response. BAER stands for brainstem auditory evoked response. But they all apply to the same kind of test. The goal of this test is to evaluate the integrity of the eighth cranial nerve at several levels. So from the peripheral nerve to the cortex um, on the broad range of hearing frequencies. So this test is basically used to assess the integrity of um, this nerve from 2 kilohertz to 4 kilohertz hearing range of a patient. On the below part of this slide, you can see the shape of the response that um, we can record using this test. And there are seven peaks that are defined, which all will give information about the transmission of the information from the auditory nerve, which is the first peak, up to the auditory cortex, which is the waveform number seven. For the stimulus, the ACNS recommends the use of clicks with a duration of 100 microseconds for adults. They give absolutely no recommendation about the, the type of stimulus that will be used, for example, rarefaction condensation. However, what they say is that the use of alternation may give poorer resolution of the responses for specific pathologies. At the same time, it is still a nice um, pattern we can use because it reduces the stimulus artifact in some cases. By all means, the stimulus should be applied monorally, so only the left ear, then only the right ear. No bilateral stimulation. The repetition rate can be applied from, um, eight, from um, 8 to uh, 200 hertz. The best repetition rate, however, would be between 8 and 10 hertz. If we stimulate above 10 hertz, the amplitude of the responses may decrease. Regarding intensity, the ACNS recommends to stimulate between 115 and 120 decibels SPL 
and apply a masking noise such as white noise on the contralateral ear um, of 60 dB below the uh, stimulus intensity. The use of masking allows to avoid responses that might be conducted through the bone. So masking will be really helpful to get proper responses. Other stimuli such as PEEPs may be applied if we want to go for frequency specific testing. So for example, to test um, a patient response to 2000 her Hertz noise or 500 Hertz noise, which is a test that can also be done in audiology. Um, in that case, for example, they say we can, uh, we can use uh, PEEPs with a black man envelope For the recordings, the ACNS um, recommends the use of four electrodes. Recording electrodes on CZ, A1 and A2, which are the two earlobes. If applying the electrodes on the earlobes is too painful, then mastoids may be used an, as an alternative. In some cases, in centers, people have been using FZ instead of CZ. The ACNS does not recommend to use this montage because the amplitude of the responses may be reduced. The ground should be placed on FZ or in children can be also placed on the shoulder. However, it's um, important to not place the electrode next to the deltoid in order to avoid ECG artifact. No matter where we place the electrodes, the impedance should be absolutely kept very low, so below 5 kilo ohms. Regarding the channels that are recorded, we will record CZ and the earlobe on the ipsilateral side and CZ and the earlobe on the contralateral side for the responses. The recording length should be at minimum 15 milliseconds so that we can see even delayed responses. I've read in some other papers that for children, for example, it's even better to use 25 to 30 milliseconds to really make sure that we can record all the waves all the markers for the auditory stimulation. The signal should be filtered between 10 Hertz and 3 kilohertz. However, what can happen, especially in this kind of very sensitive testings, is that you would have artifacts from EMG activity or noise issues from electrical systems. In that case, the ACNS says that we can change the filters from 100 to 3 kilohertz. That would reduce especially um, the electrical noise. However, it's best to keep the range as broad as possible. As we discussed before, for evoked potentials, we average the signals we can average the signals between 1,000 and 4,000 times. Of course, the lower the better because the, the test will be shorter. However, we should not stop the testing below 1,000 averages. The ACNS does not provide any recommendation in terms of supply use. And in terms of patient condition, this test can be applied whether the patient is awake, asleep, or sedated. So if there is a very difficult patient or children, sedation may be used. Regarding the results, we need to mark at least the five first waves. And what the ACNS recommends is to mark and read the latency for the peak number 135 the difference of latency between the peak 1 and 3, 3 and 5, and 1 and 5. Normally, the peak number 3 should be in the middle, so between the peak 1 and peak 5, so the latency difference between 1, 3, 3, 5 should be the same. 
and half of the latency difference between one and five. We shall also mark the amplitude of the waveform of the wave number one and five and calculate the amplitude ratio between peak four, five and one. So those are the guidelines. Now, how can we actually make this test in real life? So let's talk about the clinical workflow and how we analyze the data. Before we even think about performing the test, we need to prepare the patient. So how does it go? In terms of accessories, you can see on the right side of the screen the different alternatives you have. You may use um, subdermal needles, which are disposable, or cup electrodes to um, paste on the cortex. If you use a scalp electrodes, so the cup electrodes, you need to have two pastes with you, the new prep to prepare the skin and the 1020 to actually uh, fix and ensure good contact of your electrode. I do not have any preference between cup electrodes and the subdermal needles. All I can say is that if you use subdermal needles, it is invasive. At the same time, you can easily ensure a low impedance um, of the electrodes throughout the study. For the stimulators, we can use two types of stimulators, headsets or tubal inserts. Headset would be mostly used in clinical labs. Tubal inserts would be more for um, neonates and so on. However, all headsets have a color coding. There is one ear blue and one ear red. Red is for the right ear, blue is for the left ear. When the patient comes in, he should be sitting comfortably in, um, in a chair or lying down to make sure he is fully relaxed. If possible, the patient shall avoid moisturizer or hair gel on the day of the exam. If he comes in and he has uh, this kind of products on, you may uh, dissolve, for example, the hair gel with alcohol pads. So just um, put a little bit of um, uh, alcohol pad on the location of the electrodes, leave it on while you prepare your cup electrodes or your needles, and this may dissolve the, the product then to ensure a proper positioning of the electrodes, um, we need first to prepare the skin. So the use of new prep will allow to remove um, fats that are on the skin and ensure a proper connectivity of the, the signal. Then if we use the subdermal needles, we can just place them um, directly. And if we use cup electrodes, then we need to uh, fix them using the 1020. So we, we don't need too much paste on the cup, we just place a little bit and then press hard until the paste comes out of the hole in the middle of the electrode and protect that with a little bit of gas. All cables, they should end up in a ponytail style so that we can re reduce the noise pickup. And also if the patient has to, to move, then you have minimal risk of um, electrode removal. The impedance, once we have applied all e electrodes, should be below 5 kilo ohms. If in some cases you just cannot go up to that level, try to keep the impedance as balanced as possible between all electrodes. What I mean is if you have one electrode at 5 kilo ohms and the other one at 50, that would be worse than having the two electrodes at 15 kilo ohms. Having balanced impedance throughout all the electrodes would allow you to have um, a more stable baseline. So best case scenario, you go below 5, which is very easy with the subdermal needles. If you cannot go down to that level, then just try to keep them balanced. So when we stick the electrodes, we 
take the electrode on CZ, which will be the active electrode for um, our montage, the two earlobes, A1, A2, which will be the references, and the ground on FZ. If you go for the method where you fix the electrodes instead of the earlobes to the mastoids, be careful about the placement, because if you place them too low, you may pick up some ECG artifact. Then we put the headset on the patient with the right color on the right side of the patient, the left color on the left side of the patient. Duration of stimulus, we said, was 100 microseconds um, for adult patient. For infants, we actually apply 50 microseconds. So once this is all done, we can properly do the testing. So we place the electrodes, check the impedances, place the headset. In a clinical practice, um, what I personally like to do is first look for the patient hearing level if the patient is um, cooperative. So basically we would start the stimulation, increase it and ask the patient to tell us when he can actually hear the sound. It should be normally around 35 decibels SPL. Once this is done, we add up to 60 decibels to that value and then start averaging. I like to wait a little bit before I start averaging to allow the patient to get used to the sound, relax, and then we can start the recording. And then we would get the waveforms that you can see on the right side of the screen. On the upper channel, you can see the ipsilateral response and below the contralateral response. And we will mark the waves from one to seven. The most important ones that you need to, to see is the number one, the number three, and the number five. The contralateral channel will help you because you can see the wave 5 on it. However, this wave 5 shall have a longer latency than the wave 5 on your ipsilateral channel. So that contralateral channel helps you to mark your waves on the, the first line. For each year, we need to, to perform at least two runs just to make sure that the response is reproducible. So overall, the test will take around 30 minutes. What I describe right here is a test with a cooperative patient. If the patient cannot cooperate, just go for the ACNS guideline, apply between 110 and 120 decibels SPL, and then start averaging you will get roughly the same um, responses. In terms of results, um, we will mark the latencies for number 135, latency difference between 133515, the amplitudes for the wave number 1 and 5. The amplitude ratio, in my experience, I haven't seen it so much applied. However, what is also important to, to assess is how repute reproducible the waveforms are and if we see any asymmetry between the responses from the left stimulation and the right stimulation. Below I provide you some normative values um, we had for the testing. So it's important if you use normative values to make sure that your type of stimulation is the same exactly as the type of stimulation that they apply. So make sure that you use the same frequency rate, make sure that you use the same type of stimulus intensity, make sure that you um, apply the same stimulus duration, and then you can use those reference electrodes, those uh, reference values, pardon. 
on a general note regarding uh, the stimulus polarity, different stimulus polarity can change a little bit the, the, the shape of your waveforms. For example, rarefaction is known to enlarge the wave one. The alternation will not enlarge this wave one. However, as I said, it can have a poorer resolution in some specific pathologies. However, it can be very nice to reduce what we call the microphonic cochlear artifact, which is this ringing artifact that you can see on, on this uh, waveform on the right side of this, the slide. So that's how we would uh, perform a patient for ABR. Now there is a second testing that exists for short latencies responses, which is called the object objective hearing threshold or um, OHL testing. This test is used for auditory sc screening. Basically, it will be a series of stimulation at different intensities and then we will see if the patient has a wave 5 at these different stimulations or not. So basically this serves as an indicator of the auditory threshold without needing the patient cooperation. For that test, we use what we call the DBOHL, which is the decibels that ENTs and audiologists use. Just so you know, the decibel OHL corresponds to roughly 30 decibels SPLs. For this specific test, we use um, um, a click, uh, I mean a filtered click, or what we call a peep of a thousand hertz with rarefaction, um, duration 100 milliseconds, and a stimulus rate around 13 hertz. The electrode placing is exactly the same as the previous test. Just like the previous test, this testing has to be applied on each ear. And then we apply the stimulation at different stimulus level. So we start at a high level, 90 decibels OHL, so 90 decibels above an average hearing threshold for patient. And then we do different waveforms with steps of 10 or 20 decibels down. So basically we could do a patient with um, stimulations at 90 decibels, 70 decibels, 50 decibels, um, 30 decibels. And for each of these intensities, we will mark if we see a wave five on the waveform. When the wave five disappears, then we know that we are below the hearing threshold. To get proper responses for um, this, um, this testing, we need to make at least two averages for the highest stimulus and the threshold stimulus. So in the example on the right side, we would do at least two averages for the stimulation at 80 dB, then we go down to 60, 40, and then for 20, we need to do two averages as well. Of course, basically, in if you have the, the time, it's best to make aver two averages for every stimulus intensity. But if you're in a hurry, at least you need to make two averages for the highest stimulation, two averages for the lowest stimulations. In terms of the results, um, I've seen guidelines asking to mark the latency of the marker one, three, five, and again, uh, this difference of latencies uh, between peak 1335 and 15. In clinical practice, I've only seen um, the marker 5 being assessed. However, what we need to also mark for the reporting is the BAP threshold. So this is a um, um, number in decibels, which will provide us the hearing threshold of the patient. This threshold is the mid midpoint between the intensity where the wave, wave 5 was detected and the intensity where it has disappeared. 
So if at 20 decibels you had low wave 5 and 40 you had 1, your BAP threshold will be 30. For your information, when the stimulus decreases, the latencies of your waves will shift. So for example, for wave 5, it will shift of roughly 0 0.03 milliseconds per decibels. However, the interpeak latency will remain constant at different intensities. As you can see on the right side of the screen, there is a, a graph that has been um, done out of a seven um, patients that were normal. The thick lines are the latencies at different uh, stimulus intensity, and the dotted lines are the interpeak latencies. And as we can see, the latencies of peak 135 really go down, where the interpeak latencies remain constant. I want to talk shortly about late responses. Late responses, one of the most known tests is called the P300. This is a test that is used to assess patients' um, attention and it may be applied in ICU to, um, to um, assess the evolution of the coma and ch chances of awakening of the patient. The electrode setup is the same as for the short latency testings that we have just discussed. However, the stimulation is different. In this case, we provide two sounds. One is called standard, one is called oddball. And we will do average responses for the standard stimulation and the oddball and look at how different the waveforms are. On the oddball waveform, we will mark two peaks called N1 and P3. So N1 is around uh, 150 milliseconds. P3 would be um, around 300. But it, it changes um, with the, the patient's condition. However, just knowing that we have those waveforms, so those markers, N1 and P3, can allow to evaluate the degree of chances that the patient will wake up. This test has, um, has another alternative that is called MMN, mismatch negativity. If you are interested in that particular application, we have a clinical note on the website that actually provides you all information on the workflow for this specific technique. So finally, I want to discuss about what goes wrong when we perform AEPs. Because in those presentations, we always show how the waveforms should be and so on. However, in real life, we may have issues sometimes. So let's talk about the pitfalls. What can happen sometimes is that you find your responses to be too low. The amplitudes are too low when you start your AEPs. That may be due to the stimulation frequency. If the st uh, stimulation frequency is too high, the amplitudes will reduce. So in that case, it's best to keep the stimulus frequency below 10. So 10 is OK, but it's best to keep it below 10 not go up to 30. Sometimes we can get a very um, unclear, uh, unclear response or a lot of rejection from our waveforms. That can be due to the stimulus intensity. If the stimulus intensity is too high, it will discomfort the patient. So he will contract, you will have a lot of EMG artifact and this will not only have an effect on the quality of the waveforms, but also on the level of rejection that you will, uh, you will experience. So the, text, the, the test will uh, take longer and the quality of the waveforms will not be 
um, good. In some cases, you, you could see unstable baseline, you could see noise artifact, you could see a lot of rejection. That may be due to electrode impedance. If the electrode impedance is too high, you will pick up more noise and therefore a bad quality of your waveforms. So keep the impedance below 5 kilo ohms or try to have it balanced throughout all electrodes. Sometimes what we can experience is to have a, wave, a waveform where the peak number 1 to 5 show up correctly, but after that we have a very high amplitude response that kind of pollutes the recording. This is muscle artifact from a contraction of the jaw or the neck. It's called the post-auricular muscle artifact and it appears around 10-14 milliseconds. So this is purely due to the patient position and the use of mass suits for the reference electrodes. So in that case, first of all, check the patient position, make sure he's comfortable. And if it does not go um, better, just use the earlobes for the reference electrodes instead of mass suits. Also for the comfort of the patient, we shall make sure that there is not too much noise in the room. Another thing that happens and that I experience quite regularly is the confusion that there can be between decibels SPL and decibels OHL. Basically, this happens when I hear somebody telling me I'm stimulating at that intensity, but the sound, it, I perceive it as low compared to what I know. So this may be if we make a confusion between applying 90 dB SPL or 90 dB OHL. So the, the decibels SPL are decibels for sound pressure level, which is a term that is mostly used in neurology. A zero decibel SPL means zero pressure applied to the ear. In audiology, however, the the, the audiologists use decibels OHL, so objecting hearing level. This means that zero decibel OHL mean at this intensity I don't hear, but at one decibel I start hearing a sound. So there is a shift between dB SPL and dB OHL, and that shift is roughly 30 decibels. So 90 dB SPL for a neurolog neurologist, they correspond to 60 dB OHL that the audiologist use. And your EMG system should be able to, uh, to perform the stimulus in SPL, sti SPL style or OHL style so that you can apply your method. Finally, there is a last, um, a, a last term that may be used that you may hear of is a uh, decibel SL, which is sensation level or auditory threshold. So that is also a term you may see on your, on your um, systems, but that's purely the assessment of the auditory threshold of a cooperative patient. What you can also experience is ringing of the waveform at the beginning of um, of your recordings, such as is shown on the um, on the picture on the right side of the screen, this is called the microphonic cochlear artifact. This this is absolutely normal. It can appear mostly when you use rarefaction or condensation as a stimulus. If you want to get rid of this, just change your stimulus to alternation mode. In that case, the ringing will be one time up one time down and when we average it will just cancel finally let's talk about the noise artifact the other instruments that are in the room can have an effect on your recording and what you would see is 50 or 60 hertz noise on your signal and it's extremely painful when you are performing aeps so if you experience noise 
on uh, your waveforms, here is what you need to do. The first thing is to check the ground electrode. Make sure it has a low impedance. Uh, maybe change it for an electrode that has a larger surface of recording. To reduce the pickup of the noise, you can braid your electrodes. If your cables are, are not together, so the recording's cables, if they go in every direction, every cable will see a different type of noise and it will damage the quality of your recording. So braid them together and this will reduce the noise. If that doesn't work, unplug all unnecessary power supplied systems in the room. So unused computers, um, laptop chargers, um, the, um, the chair of the bed or the bed. And finally, also fluorescent lights may have an effect. So turn off fluorescent lights if that's the kind of light that you have in your laboratory. Hopefully with all these tricks, you will be able to, uh, to um, make some good recordings with the AEPs. Thank you for your attention. If you want to download this webinar, just register on our website. We'll have access to all this presentation, the videos, and also register for upcoming events. If you have any questions, contact me on my email that is displayed here. I'll be happy to help. Thank you very much.